volgende presentatie, die, uh, die spreker kan er helaas niet bij zijn, dat is um, dokter uh, Goldwardy. En die is vanwege gezondheidsomstandigheden uh, niet in staat om hier te komen, maar heeft zijn presentatie opgenomen op film. Dat komt. Hallo, ik ben Andrew Goldsworthy. Ik ben een retired lecturer van Imperial College London. En toen ik daar werkte, voor veel jaren, een van mijn pet interests was hoe animals en plants use electric currents, dat is natural electric currents that they generate themselves and use for all sorts of purposes. Now, first let me explain a little bit about how electricity flows through plants and animals. It's carried by ions, that is electrically charged atoms and molecules that flow through their cells. Now, these currents are generated by ion pumps in the cell membrane that drive ions through the membrane using metabolic energy. This is a typical bacterial cell. It's surrounded by a membrane and it uses its metabolic energy derived from its food to pump hydrogen ions positively charged hydrogen ions out through the membrane. This generates an electrochemical gradient and some of those hydrogens are let back in again and their energy is used to generate ATP from ADP. Now ATP is the main energy currency of the cell and it's also used to pump nutrients into the cell against a concentration gradient. So the energy of the hydrogen ion gradient is used for two main purposes that is to generate ATP and to pump in nutrients. These are of course um, delivered electrically and there is a electrical circuit carrying these hydrogen ions round and round and round. And as you can imagine the insulator has to be very good, that is the cell membrane. If anything happens to make that membrane leak then it short circuits the whole system and none of the processes will work properly if at all. We've already seen that plant cells use DC currents extensively, but not alternating currents. Alternating electromagnetic fields damage cell membranes by removing structurally important calcium ions and it results in the cells leaking. This was first discovered in the 1970s by Suzanne Borwin and her co-workers in Ross Aidy's lab. I can explain briefly uh, why this loss of calcium is important. Cell membranes consist of negatively charged components which are held together by positively charged calcium ions. Uh, it's rather like the bricks in a wall are held together by the cement in between them. The positive ions hold together the negative membrane components. If you take some of this calcium away the membrane becomes weaker and more inclined to leak. Now this sort of leakage can short circuit the membrane potentials that we have already seen and reduce the efficiency of energy production and energy utilization and perhaps also disrupt the orderly growth of polar cells. 
But perhaps the most serious effect of membrane leakage is through the membranes of lysosomes and vacuoles. Lysosomes in animals, vacuoles in plants. Uh, this is because these organelles are membrane bound and they contain various toxic materials and also digestive enzymes that are normally used to recycle unwanted materials. And these enzymes include DNAs, which destroys DNA. And it's already been shown that mobile phone radiation uh, can shatter the DNA of animal tissue cultures in a matter of hours. And this leads to mutations, loss of function and possible cell death. The same may be true of plants. But what is happening to our trees? The bark seems to crack and the cracks get infected and you get cancer-like growths, phloem nodules, just underneath the bark. Is there any explanation for this? Well, Possibly there is. If, as the work with conditioned water suggests, there is an initial stimulation of growth, that may not be a good thing, because you would expect the areas to grow are those which are already programmed to grow and are growing, such as the cambium, which divides to increase the girth of the tree. Well, if this happens too fast, then the tree increases its diameter too rapidly and the bark cracks. And this could result in foreign organisms getting in and causing infection. But what about the nodules? Well, I can tell you what may happen here based upon what we know about tissue cultures. Plant tissue cultures can be made by putting a piece of plant onto a culture medium containing large amounts of growth hormone. And you find that the cut edges grow out as a form of callus which continues growing indefinitely as a sort of undifferentiated mass so long as there are large amounts of growth hormone present. If you remove that growth hormone by putting it onto a fresh culture medium the mass starts to differentiate into what looks remarkably like your phloem nodules. A little bit of vascular tissue surrounded by sort of callus-like tissue. Now is this what is happening in your trees? Could it be that the Initial stimulation of growth involves the production of large amounts of growth hormone which produced this sort of callus-like structure under the bark in the phloem and when the growth subsided and you hit the inhibitory phase then they began to differentiate and you see what you now see as phloem nodules. This is just a guess, but it fits with what we know.